So the song that Mary prays is a magnificent example of the true faith and honor to the Lord. And the reason why she did this, because she was truly praising him for what he has truly done in her life. Theologian R.C. Sproul said that Mary's song, that Magnificat, is one of the most important hymns in the history of the church. Bible commentator William Barclay wrote, it has been, has said that the relig- religion of the opiate of the people, but it has also said that the Magnificat is the most revolutionary document in the world. These are strong words for a song that we, not, we don't really know very well, that we don't truly know. Mary's song gives us clear, a clear way of worshiping God, and, and this teaches us the, the word and the, and the gift of the glory of who he truly, truly is. And I think it's important during this time, as we go into the Christmas season, that we focus on, on the important things and not so much the lights and the, and the presents and, and the trees. This prayer teaches us that it is much more important than that. That it's the credit to a Savior, the glory that the God Almighty truly deserves. We will be following along in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 56. Now we'll be reading out of the Legacy Standard Bible this evening, which is a new translation revised from the NASB 95 as well from the 2020 version. This Bible is about as close as you can get to the original manuscripts. It's translated into English from the original Hebrew and Greek. It's a beautiful masterpiece of a Bible. Um, If you have a chance to look at it, you can. You can also go to our website, uh, newstartna.org, and hit Bible reading, and you can follow along with this version as well. I recommend you do so. So Mary began her song with with a statement. This song consists, consists of Old Testament allusions and, and quotations. She said, she said Magnify, magnifies the Lord. How can one magnify someone who is already infinite? And his eternal power is in his person. The Lord is omnipotent, and we know that, that the Lord is, is everywhere. He's all-knowing. He's all wise. He's eternal. He's unchanging. He never he never changes that he exists because of who he is. All of his loving, his, his merciful, his gracious, he's faithful, he's holy. This takes place in the encounter of Mary and Elizabeth, and the setting is the, the home of Zacharias and Elizabeth's home. That's where the setting is. This is another form of of the servant nature that we read from Mary. We read a couple of weeks ago of Elizabeth coming and greeting Mary. Uh, The week before that, we talk about uh, Zacharias being mute. And we talk about how Mary came in her travels to talk to Elizabeth. And this continues from that same encounter. This is another form of, of her servant nature and how she served Yahweh. In the first set of verses, in verse 46, we see Mary magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. What do you think when, we, when she states magnifies? What do, we, what do we know when we hear the word magnifies? It's truly because he's already magnified because of his nature and who he truly is. Either Jehovah the Father, the Son, who as he was David's Lord according to his divine nature, though his Son after the flesh was in the same sense. Mary's Lord as well as her Son, and by magnifying him it is meant not making him great because we understand that he is great. That word's not explaining that he's great. 
for he can, cannot be greater than what he truly, truly is. But by ascribing the greatness to him, even the perfections of the deity, and praising him on the account of them, and also declaring and speaking well of his, his many and mighty works of power and goodness and, and grace and mercy. That's what he's describing there when, he's, when they say magnifying. See, she understands the magnificent nature of the Lord already inside the womb. She knows that already. And there's nothing that can be said to ultimately magnify him larger than what he truly is because that's his nature that's who he is. In verse 47, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. The Holy Spirit that indwells in her was rejoicing joy. We read this in Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And that's what she's referring to when she talks about that. That my spirit has rejoiced. It's an it's a understanding of a joy that cannot be measured. Knowing that she's carrying the Lord. The greatest birth that has ever taken place. We all have children inside this room and we say, wow, that was a remarkable day. Of when my child was born. I have three of them. I had three days. But can you understand the multitude and the magnificent nature of the Lord being born inside a tiny manger that probably wasn't very appealing? It probably looks better than our hospital rooms that we had our children. I guarantee you that. It's a magnificent feeling when you can think about and rejoicing of the joy of the Lord and who He truly is. We also read in Romans 12, verse 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Luke stated this well in his writing as well, stating that Mary, Mary states, God, my Savior. We know that God is the only Savior that we rely on. We read it in Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. It states His deity. It states who He truly is. We read in the book of Jeremiah that the Lord God was the only salvation for Israel. Notice also that we, we hear the soul magnifies and the spirit rejoices magnifies equals greatness above all and rejoicing equals joy we read for he has looked upon the humble state of his slave he has looked upon the low the humble condition of his handmaid that is Note this withstanding her, her humble rank and, and who she was in her, in her poverty. He has shown her favor, favor. He doesn't look at social status. He doesn't look at your bank accounts. He doesn't look at what, what you have done. It doesn't matter whether you're poor or wealthy. None of that truly matters. God is not a respecter of persons that he has not influenced in conferring favors of wealth and honor or office. We read in Romans 2, verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. He is not partial to save. He wants to see us humble. He wants to see repentance to completely turn away from our sins. Paul was Saul. Paul was a murderer of Christians. Matthew was an evil tax collector. This verse is clear that we are seeing faithfulness towards his elect, no matter the condition that you are. That doesn't matter the condition that he sees favor inside his people. 
He takes us when we are lost. He gives us a new heart. And in the end, we are glorified with Him after our sanctification stage. All generations, when we hear about all generations, that's all people, all posterity. It says, call be blessed. Pronounce me highly favored or, or happy being in the mother of the Messiah. It is therefore right to consider her as highly favored and happy, full of joy. Those, those other characteristics, she's happy, full of joy because she is has the Lord inside of her. Abraham was blessed in being the father, being faithful. Paul and being the apostle of the Gentiles, those are different examples of him being happy and full of joy for what he was doing and how he was serving the Lord. Peter in his first preaching of the gospel, all of these events were highly favored events. They, they, were, they were moments in their lives that they gave God the glory that he truly deserves. When we read the mighty one, when we think of mighty and, and how strong that could be, that word, we think of God because he's the true mighty one. With respect to the incarnation of Christ, a new, a great, and unheard thing and causing her through a, through a virgin to conceive, to bear their son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ is the Savior that we are all in need of. We read, and holy is his name, seeing this was, this was brought without impurity. Through this overshadowing influence of the Holy Ghost, whereby the human nature was preserved in the infection of sin, because we know sin has infected us in this world. And being united to the Son, to the Son of God, and the sacrifice. Sacrifice is important to understand. We see the birth. We talk about the birth a lot of times during this time of the year because we're leading up to Christmas, but we need to understand the sacrifice for his people. This may also regard to the great things that God has done in her as far as Mary in a, in a spiritual sense and the choice of her to eternal life. And the redemption of her by the Messiah and in her regeneration, and we talk about sanctification wherein God has displayed his, his sovereign grace upon her. His grace and his goodness. We, we sing about that in the hymns, but do we truly understand God's grace and his goodness and what it means to us as Christians? And we hold on to grace even when we're not worthy of his grace and understand his justice his divine justice and his holiness. Psalms 96, 9 says, Worship Yahweh in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all of the earth. It says to tremble. We can conclude in, in verse 48 when it means God's faithfulness. Verse 49 means his holiness and his power. As we go throughout the scriptures, we understand the words that it's telling us and it compares to other pieces of scriptures inside the Bible and then we can, we can truly understand the context and what it's saying. In verse 50, we see characteristics of God and Mary talking about His mercy. We, we, we read His mercy, that's favor shown towards the miserable and the guilty. That's favor. Favor, which is... We, nothing that we warrant, nothing that we merit. But he still gives us favor. He still gives us mercy. Upon generation, after generation, when we read that, after generation, his mercy doesn't end. It's always existing for generation to generation. That it's never truly ending. 
always existing. To the end of the world, it's always existing. To God's elect in, in all of different times, in all of different places, it's existing. It's always there. His mercy doesn't end. Hebrews 4.16 says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. See, as unbelievers, we don't understand God's grace. We don't understand what it means. We don't understand how to draw near. But when we are born with a new heart, we know how to draw near to Him because then we desire Him. When we do not have a new heart, we don't desire His grace and His goodness. We desire sin and we desire hell. But when we have a new heart, we desire the love and compassion and the grace that he pours upon his people. At the end of verse 50, we read, toward those who fear him. See, this is not a fear which we ought to have towards God. It's a fear which a dutiful, dutiful child of a kind and virtuous father of fear and injury of his feelings like we should be concerned with how he feels towards us because of what we do. That's the difference. We should be in fear of the Lord. We should be in fear of God every single day because of his nature and how, how absolutely sovereign he is. We should be in fear of him. We should be. But we should also understand his characteristics. We should also understand his nature and we should understand how he truly is. We should have fear in the same fear that we have towards our sovereign father that we have towards our own father. You know, we, uh, we all grew up in a certain way to where we're like, the mother is the nurturing one. The father is the disciplinarian. So we want to please him so we don't get a spanking. And that's how it is. That's true. We want to please our Father, just like we want to please our Sovereign Father every single day. We read in Job 28, 28, So he said to man, Behold the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. So we turn away from evil which is what we're supposed to do, but we're supposed to fear the Lord. It is wisdom that we gain from fearing the Lord. Ezekiel 30, 13 says, Thus says Lord Yahweh, I will also destroy the idols and make the images cease from Memphis, and there will no longer be a prince in the land of Egypt, and I will put fear in the land of Egypt. Fear in the land of Egypt. We need fear. Fear is good to have towards our Father because it makes us understand His wisdom and it makes us understand His nature. And if we don't have that fear, then we don't understand His characteristics and we're not connected to Him the way we should. Verse 51, we read, He has done a mighty deed with His arm. When we talk about an arm, an arm symbol, symbolizes strength. It symbolizes brute strength to go to battle in a war. When the proud Assyrian, Egyptian, and Babylonian had come against the people of God, he had often scattered them and driven their armies away, all because of who he is, because of his nature. And that's what he did. And it's all because of his providence. And then what he did is he poured out his grace to his people. Such method, methods as tend to be humble and confound to them have particularly it may regard in the high and haughty Jews that we read. We talk about the Jews being high and haughty. Well, he would take them out of their land because of who he was. 
In verse 52, Mary states, He has brought down rulers from his thrones, evil rulers as mighty kings and emperors of their thrones, as he often does in the course of his providence. He's God, and he does that, and he did that. Rebelling, people rebelling against God and, and opposing the incarnation of Christ. These many rulers were the same rulers that put Christ on a cross and made him suffer. Well, they were taken care of because of that. But in the same nature, we got to understand what God's providence is and how in control he is that he does these things and he takes care of those rulers. And it's just stated right there in Luke when he's talking about talking about taking the rulers, evil rulers away. That's what that means. It talks about scattering those that are proud. In their hearts. And they are reserved with chains of darkness because of that, because of being evil, because of what they've done. Read exalted is a is a person of a of a rank or of, of status, and they're placed at a higher powerful le- level, held in high regard. See, it had taken, taken her years of hard in fighting to reach her present exalted rank as David to the throne of Israel from the sheepfold and following the, the use of with great and young and now his house and family which were sunk very low by raising of his seed, a poor virgin. We understand who Mary is as a, as a poor virgin in his family. She was rose up to carry the Lord, to carry him. See, when we talk about humble, uh, those humble people, I think we're all humble. The alcoholics, the addiction to porn, the virgin. The common sinner, lost in the world, being used to glorify him. We all have that sin that we struggle with. And we've all been turned, his elect has been turned to glorify him. It's amazing when you see people turn from their sin, from their their addiction, from who they are, who they were, into somebody that's being used to glorify the kingdom. I remember being a lost, lost soul. Very lost. <laughs> very, very lost. Many sins you struggle and deal with every single day. Before Jesus took me out of that sin. He told me to follow him. He changed that broken heart, that heart of stone to a heart of love, to a heart of joy, into a heart of understanding truly His nature and His providence. He used to glorify Him. We read in verse 53, He has filled the hungry with good things, desired and longed after the coming of the Messiah, as good old Simeon and, and Anna, and those who look for redemption in Israel. To those who spoke in such persons as heartily desire salvation by Christ and breathe after the forgiveness of their sins through his blood and thirst after his righteousness. So we turn from that sin, from that that thing that confines us in something that we can never get out of. We're like, we are lost. And you know what? We continue our sin because we love our sin and whether we all believe that or not that there's something that we don't struggle with that if we think that we're haughty and that we're full of power we are completely wrong 
There might be other sins that are well known that people see, but you're battling with a sin that you can't even understand its nature. And Jesus takes us out of that sin, starts to change us and puts us through this sanctification process to where we understand Scripture clearly, we understand His nature, we understand what it means, we understand what other people are struggling with, and we can see that. And then we continue, and it's an ongoing process. And it continues. It's always continuing. But we read that here, talking about the slave. We read that she's talking about the humble person, the person that is struggling, the person that it's, she's talking to is, is pretty much, she's, it's her song and she's praising, but she's talking about the things we, sh- we all struggle with. And it's real. It is truly real. And we gain a, a greater knowledge of him and who he truly is throughout our processes. And we conform with him and we understand his nature. We read when it says, and sent away the rich, the empty handed. This is not the rich in, in world's goods, though, such who trust in their wealth and boast in their riches or do not have a proper way of using them. God in his providence sometimes strips them all away, strips away all the financial help that you have. Everything that you have worked for for your entire life be stripped away and turns them into a world of, of naked and empty, much less the rich in grace who are often the poor of the world that we read of these people used inside the Bible that are completely living in poverty, but that are used in a glorified way for him. With uh, no possessions, but they are full. They are full. In my opinion, they're full in the richness of God's mercy and of his grace. And sometimes he puts us and he gives us enough for all that we need. Now, you may not be blessed to where you have a huge mansion or to where you have five or six cars living in, you know, sitting in your driveway. But God has blessed you enough for what he wants from you to be his servant. That's more than enough. His grace is so overwhelming and it's so powerful and it's so full that he's only going to give us all that he has and that should always, always be enough. When we grow up, we see things in the media, we see things in the world of this is all the things we should have and we should have so much money, so much finances and the biggest house on the block. The biggest in the block is God's grace and His mercy. And there's nothing else that can be bigger than that. Especially the kids listening in service tonight. It's not about all of the big fi- fancy cars or, or being uh, all the jewelry. None of that matters. All that matters is that you're a faithful servant towards Christ and that you are, are called upon Him every single day and praising Him and understanding Him. And he blesses his elect with how he sees fit because he is sovereign enough to do so. And his providence is all that we can ever ask for. The only things that when we talk about works inside the Bible, see, our only good works are done from Christ. That there's nothing else that are more worthy than that. When we do good works, it's not about Catrice Walker doing the good works. It's not about Lauren Williamson doing the good works. It's about Christ doing those works through us to make those things happen. That's what's made important to him, and that's what he sees. See, the throne of grace is glorious. The throne of grace, which is important to us. That we see a father and his son is sitting to his right. 
That's the important thing. As we see, as we're very similar to the Pharisees, that we, uh, that we can't understand his nature. And the works that we do is all for us to be magnified and glorified. The works that we should do is to glorify our Christ, and he gets exalted in the end. 1 Samuel 2, verse 7 says, Yahweh makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. You read this in Job as well, where he lost everything and it was all stripped away. Everything he had was stripped away. To God, faith in him to gain all he needed. He didn't need possessions. He didn't need any of that. None of that was needed. He needed the faith in God alone. And he understood that. He exalts his elect in the righteousness undeserved. Proverbs 28.6 says, Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than he who is crooked and double-dealing, though he be rich. Understand that. If you pick that apart, better is the poor who walks in his integrity, not our integrity, than he who is crooked and and double dealing even though he may be rich he may have this he may be able to what it was the word make it rain they can do that but that goes away his grace his mercy his righteousness which you don't have because you're worried about that it's idolatry You are in need of a Savior. And to understand His nature and His grace and mercy is more than what is needed. You know, we've been blessed to have a place to worship. But I've always always told my family this. I said, if they take the building away, we're going to worship God. We're going to find a place to worship, whether it's outside in 30-degree weather or whether we're inside of a shed. We will worship Him. And it's not about having the biggest, fanciest church. It's about exalting him and praising him and singing words, singing songs of hymns to him every Sunday. That's what's important. In verse 54, we read, he has given help to Israel, his servant, meaning not to the the natural posterity of Jacob or, or Israel in general, but the elect of God among them. For all were not of Israel. Who were of those, all that were inside Israel who were not Israel. And there's a reason. Because we see the election of God. But also the, the chosen ones among the Gentiles, who with the former make up the whole Israel of, of God in a spiritual and mystical sense, these are the Israel. That God has chosen and redeemed and called by His grace. And are here, are styled by His servant. Israel, uh, Isaiah Isaiah 41.8 says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, seed of Abraham, my friend. We read in remembrance of his mercy, Mary does not leave us with just those attributes of God or or we would not dare to approach him. She goes to emphasize God's great mercy. God's mercy and his grace are close in meaning. Both emphasizing his undeserved favor. Romans 11.30 says this, For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have have shown mercy because of their disobedience. Mercy. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have you shown mercy because of their disobedience. Mercy provided by a Redeemer. 
We know the mercy is only from a redeemer. It is nothing that is owed to us. The redeemer came. He lived. He shown love and pity upon the sinner. When we, we talk about Jesus, we, we talk about, obviously, his attributes, right? We talk about his love and, and who he was and, and how he, he had people follow him. And he was a teacher and he, he showed mercy to people when we're undeserving. But understand this, saints, that, that Jesus did much more than that. Jesus also told us to repent and to turn away from our sins. When he met the woman at the well, he didn't tell her, you know, it's all about love and compassion and it's, it's okay. Continue in your sin. It's to repent, to turn away from our sin. We don't, the, the modern church doesn't like talking about repent. Repentance doesn't exist in the modern church. Repentance is how you come to salvation. It's not done through repeating something. It's done by repentance. That's salvation. And that's the mercy and the love of God that he gives upon his people. That's true obedience. It's not works of righteousness done by men. It's done of works of righteousness done by Christ. That's who he is. In the abundant mercy of our God, of our Savior, of who He is. It's the abundant mercy, undeserving. Verse 55. We're getting there, guys. As He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. See, to David of those of whose family of Mary was, and to Jacob or Israel of those whose stock she was, and to Isaac in whom she she, whom the seed was to be called in particularly to Abraham to his seed forever and we understand that his seed lasted forever we understand that his his seed lasted forever that it's never ending it's the promise it's truly the promise we read in Genesis twenty two eighteen, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have listened to to my voice. It says that in Genesis. We're reading the birth in a couple weeks, Christmas Eve, in Luke. He states that at the beginning of time. In your seed. When you put the two together, it's a wonderful thing. Verse 56, this brings time close to the the birth of the baptist the birth of john the baptist as we know we might as well deem it likely that the virgin waited for it on the other hand the next verse seems almost to imply her previous departure in any case we may think about these three months as a time of, of much communion of heart when she's talking about she stayed for three months and then she left and hope on the great things which God has done and what he's about to do to the people of Israel. She spent three months and went back to her house at, at Nazareth. And see, we can take from this that Mary responds to Elizabeth's praise in, in her own song. This, every piece of the scripture there from verse 46 to 56 is a song. And we can take that. We understand that. The Magnificat responds to the Elizabeth as a praise to God. The whole thing is nothing but praising him and glorifying him and who he truly is. But it's also a proclamation of divine fulfillment. We understand that it's fulfilled. We see that it's fulfilled inside the scriptures. Praising the Lord for what has happened in her life. Not only hers, but Elizabeth's. And Zacharias is still mute during that time, but for him as well. The praise has been, been brought into a modern hymn that we listen to. 
but it's so much more than just a hymn. It's a form of divine providence, and it is a praise and honor to Yahweh, to our God. And we know that. Mary glorifies his power and his sovereignty, a God who is worthy of all our praise. We should praise him in our lives every single day. We should praise him and honor him because we are able to do so. We read here in Exodus 15, 12, Yahweh is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will extol him. About to wrap it up, folks. As we move closer inside of our text, we are talking about the birth of John the Baptist, and we will begin chapter 2, where we discuss the, the birth of our Savior, I encourage the saints to understand the importance of the text and really see the importance of the, you, of the words that are used. When we read our scripture, we need to understand the words. If we do not understand the words, there are different websites that will tell us the word that we can utilize. Like we discussed with Mary's praise, she calls out to the Lord, a lowly, undeserving person as Mary, as who she is. And utilize her to be the most important mother of all time. To carry the, fa the Father's Son. To carry the Lord. Our God utilizes this unworthy person to perform His work. Hear me out. The addict. To perform His work. The adulterer. To perform His work. The murderer to perform his work the tax collector to perform his work and gave them a new heart to do so to do good works to glorify himself the one true god to be idolized the creator of the light with a single command understand the magnificent nature magnificent nature on who he truly is and what he has done and what he continues to do in this season. And then we understand him and his glory, glory his true, magnificent glory magnified. We need to ask ourselves, can we truly give him the glory that he deserves? Or do we continue to glory in our sin of addiction and of other sins? We should exalt him every chance that we may receive. Because as we know, time draws near. the gatekeeper drawing closer it's up to us to give him to glorify to glorify him and give him all the honor that is needed let us pray heavenly father we come to you tonight glorifying you an undeserving person as you've done inside your scriptures you've you've used people that are undeserving to 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 glorify you in every way possible doing the same tonight in this house you're doing that with his with your elect with the saints you are glorifying people and giving them the works needed to honor you to show you all the honor and the praise we're going through that process heavenly father use us use us every single day to give you the honor and to give you all the praise. All these children, raise them up inside homes that can give you the honor and the praise. Give them the ability to read scripture and to understand the context and to understand your word completely so that we can spread them throughout the nations. So that we can get away from a sinful world that is fallen and that is destroying because of man. 
We know you have a plan and that you are a sovereign nature and that you understand what is going on and that you are going to take your people. It's already in work. Father, we're amazed at your mercy and of your greatness. Allow us to sing songs of praise to you, just as Mary did. Allow us to, to have the voice needed to do so and to, uh, to allow us to understand your nature needed in this world. And we come with you, we come to you with, on our knees and our hands lifted high in need of this world as a Savior because we're lost. But we try to get closer and closer to you throughout our process of a Christian and our process of saint. We exalt you. Jesus' holy name. Amen.